So we have arrived at that moment that we arrive at annually where we think about New Year's resolutions. Now, some of you, just the thought of that makes you groan inside. However your relationship is to New Year's resolutions, maybe you uh, have stopped making resolutions uh, years ago. Uh, maybe you can't even remember the last time you made a resolution. Or maybe the resolutions you have are fresh on your mind and you are thinking, yeah, there's certain things in my health or more sleep or more dieting or how I use my money or things like that that you're starting to like say, yes, I need to have these goals and I need to get past February. Just get past February. If I can get past February, then I'm good on my resolutions. Well, however you relate to resolutions and New Year's resolutions, the one thing that we do need to live with is resolve. We do need to live with resolve, meaning you want to live for the main things. You want to live for something you want. There's something you want and desire that you're, you want to shoot for in your life because that's, that's going to be the trajectory you go into. You follow your desire. You follow what you want. And so whatever it is you want, you put resolve behind it to say, I want this and I'm going to go get it. That's resolve. And if you want to know a golden res resolution in terms of resolve, it's what Paul said. The Apostle Paul said this in Philippians 3, uh, verse 10. He said, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. I want to know Christ. Can you do better than that? You got anything else you want that gets beyond that? The way that Paul says it? Are you resolved to know Jesus more this year? Are you resolved to know him? Now, when we talk about knowing Jesus, what goes in your mind? What are you thinking of? Because usually the thing we, we think of with Jesus is usually his finished work. We think of the cross. We think of the resurrection. We think of what he came to do, the fact that he came to this world. He, in, he was incarnate, right? So we think of what he's done, and then we, we read about it, we study it, we celebrate it, we sing about it, and that's all good. But he's still working. There's a Jesus who is still ongoing in his work. Right now, Jesus is working and moving and acting. And this is the Jesus that we also need to know. So is there more to know about Jesus? Yes, there is. Yes, there is. Because there is a Jesus who is on the move right now, and he is currently working. What's he doing? What is he up to? What is his posture towards you right now, in this moment, in this time? Uh, Trisha and I, we celebrated our anniversary yesterday, 12 years. And if I said to Trisha, if I said, I want to know you, so I'm going to go make copies of your first grade pictures. And I'm going to interview your first grade teacher. And I'm going to interview all the students in your class and, who were in first grade with you. And I'm going to take the next few months to do that. And then I'll get back to you next anniversary when I know you. If I said that, I'm pretty sure she would say, why don't you just get to know me right here, right now? I'm right here. Why don't you get to do that? Why don't you get to know me? Now, if I do that, that means knowing Trisha is going to require something of me. It's going to require more than just research or phone calls. It's going to require me orienting myself around her life. I'm going to want to know what she wants. I'm going to know, want to know her routines. What's important to her? Where is she spending her time? What, is, what are her goals? That is going to require me to start to walk with her, start to orient myself around her. If I'm really going to know her, there's a realignment 
a reorientation that's required of me if I'm going to know Tricia. Same thing with Jesus. And I wonder if this is a hitch in us that keeps us from wanting to know him. Because if we want to know Jesus, it's going to require some reorientation, some realignment. I'm going to have to orient myself around what Jesus wants, where Jesus goes, the things that's on his mind, the way he's working. I got to reorient myself around him. And I wonder if we get to a point with Jesus where we say, uh, I don't know if I can know anything else because we don't want to realign ourselves. We're comfortable in our space. We like the lifestyle we have. And so I don't want to really do all that work if it means realigning or getting to know Jesus. I wonder if you, or you're hung up there. If you're hung up in that space right there, it's like, uh, to know Jesus, because what Paul says there is, yeah, it's to know the power of his resurrection and participate in his sufferings. So Paul knows if I'm going to know Jesus, I'm going to need to know something about this resurrection power and suffering. Ooh, that's another level, right? Knowing Jesus is going to require something a reorientation of my life. Am I willing to do that? Because we can go through and learn about Jesus, read all the Bible stories, sing about Jesus, research Jesus, know everything that the historical Jesus has to offer to us. And there are plenty of professors in Ivy League schools who know Jesus probably better than any of us do, but they're atheists and they're agnostics. It is possible to do all your research and know all this information about Jesus without knowing Jesus. Because if you're going to know Jesus, it means it's going to call something of you. Right? So this is, this is part of what we need to figure out. Am I willing to know Jesus to the point that I'm willing to orient myself around him? and make changes in my life so that I can get to know Jesus in this way. So the writer of Hebrews, he's completely aware of this. And he says, you know what? Actually, that's the point. The point is knowing Jesus is going to reorient your life in a great way, in a, in a wonderful way. In fact, it's in the way that God intended. If you know Jesus, and you get reoriented around him, you're actually going to be living out the destiny that God has for you in your life. So let's start with verse 5. It, the writer says, It's not to angels that he subjected the world to come about which we are speaking. What's he speaking about? He's saying, look, God designed that the world, the creation, be subjected under the dominion of somebody. And who is that? It's us. It's humanity. You go back to Genesis, God created us to rule. That's what he's saying. And then he quotes Psalm 8. Psalm 8, wonderful psalm, talks about God's design of humanity. What is man? That you are mindful of him. Right? That's what he goes on and talks about here. What is mankind? You're mindful of him and that the Lord would care for him. And you made humanity just second, just below the angels. And you crowned him with glory so that he would rule as a fellow regent, a fellow ruler with God over creation. That is what we were intended to be. And then he goes into verse 8 a little bit further. He says, in putting everything under him, God left nothing that is not subject to him. Everything was supposed to be under our stewardship, under our rule. That's what was supposed to happen. God left nothing that is not subject to him. And then he goes on to say, yet, at present, we don't see everything subject to them. Ugh. I think I was studying this portion of it in and and the Whitney Houston song came to my mind didn't we almost have it all right we were supposed to rule and reign and yet it's not happening why because we sinned and with sin 
death came into the world. And that is what brought us down from the place in which we were supposed to rule and bring shalom and bring goodness and beauty and wonder into the world. And yet we, we were negligent and we left it. And so that leaves us really hanging here. The writer of Hebrews is saying, this is what we're supposed to be, and then we're not. And so then what happens? Are we just left there? No. It says in verse 9, but we do see Jesus. And this is where knowing Jesus comes into play. The suspense lingers until that verse. The suspense of what happens then to our role? What happens to our destiny? It comes back when we see Jesus. When we see Jesus, that's when we see hope. We see that Jesus was made also a little while lower. That's his incarnation. That's his humiliation. That's his death on the cross. And then you crowned him and so he was raised. And then he was ascended to the right hand of the Father. And then it says you put everything in subjection under his feet. See, that's Jesus, his exaltation, his final triumph. So what is happening? The language of Psalm 8 that was intended for us as humanity is now fulfilled in Jesus. Jesus took the path of humanity so that he could bring us to the place that we were supposed to be with him. You see? That's why knowing Jesus reorients us. If we know Jesus, the one who was incarnate and suffered and died, and we know Jesus as the one who was raised, ascended, and exalted, then knowing Jesus means you're going to be united with Jesus. That Jesus didn't just die for you, you died with him. That Jesus didn't just rise for you, you rose with him. Jesus didn't just go to the right hand of the Father, you are seated with him in heavenly places. If you know Jesus, then your life is going to get reoriented to the point that now you're doing life from the standpoint of ruling with Jesus in heavenly places. You with me? You see how knowing Jesus reorients you now? Because so many of us, we don't, we don't do life from that perspective. We don't do life as people who are co-reigning with Jesus, who are standing in his victory over sin and death and the evil one. We don't do life that way. We do life based on what we see in the news. Oh, what a world, right? Uh, everything's broken. What a mess. We're here just trying to survive. That's usually our perspective. But Jesus is saying, no, you get to know me, you'll get to know you, the you that you're supposed to be, with me, right? And when I, you know yourself in me, you will now change the way that you live. You'll look at the world differently. You'll look at the world as one who rules with me, right? You in for that? You up for that this year? You want to know Jesus in a way that allows you to rule with him? You want to know Jesus in a way that brings the kingdom down to San Francisco? You want to know him that way? I don't know. What's better than that? Not sure what else is better than that. That's pretty good. So that's, that's what the whole thing is about knowing Jesus. If I resolve to know Jesus then I do need to resolve to orient myself around him. And when I'm oriented around him, then I'm going to know him in certain ways that allows me to know what it means to rule with him. Are we, are we, we there? We good? Okay. Yeah? Sort of? Okay, some of you? All right. All right. Well, there's a few things that this text tells us about that if I know him as in certain roles, then I will then reorient myself around him in these certain roles. And there's, there's these roles. He's my pioneer. He's my brother. He's my worship leader. He's my deliverer. And he's my priest. When we get to know Jesus in these roles, my pioneer, my brother, my worship leader, my deliverer, and my priest, then we will start to see ourselves with Jesus and begin to rule with him. But we need to know him this way. 
So we're only going to get to two. We're only going to get to Jesus as our pioneer and as our brother today. And then we'll get to the next three next time. So first, knowing Jesus as our pioneer, he says right here, in bringing many sons and daughters to glory in verse 10, right? So this is what we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be in glory reigning with him. And Jesus brings us with him, brings sons and daughters with him. We're, we are with him if we believe and trust in Jesus. We are with him in this glorious position of glory reigning with him. And then it says this, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. Pioneer, there it is. Jesus is our pioneer. When you think pioneer, what comes to your mind? Pioneer is somebody who maybe is a pioneer in science, an innovator, somebody who creates something or uh, is creating a new pathway or, or a new drug or something in research, right? Or, or you might think a pioneer as someone who is making their way west, right? right? Making their way through the gold rush, coming to California. We were in Kansas, and there's actually signs along the road that says Independence Trail to California and Oregon. So there were people back in the 1800s who are trying to make their way to California, and they found their way to California through hardship. They found it through trial and error, but they found it. And what did that do for us? Everybody else who wanted to go west would just follow that trail. You follow that trail and you avoid the hardship. You avoid going through the wrong directions if you follow the trail, right? So Jesus is our pioneer. He pioneered a way for us who were fallen in sin to come out of sin and then be restored back to that path of ruling with him. And he did it. Nobody else did it. Nobody else could do it. And so that's the only path that will bring us there is if we follow Jesus. If we follow Jesus as our pioneer. Right? If you want to rule, then you got to follow him. Now here's the thing. What does that require of me? Remember, there's some reorientation that takes place. If he's my pioneer, then I then need to say, okay, you lead. You tell me what it means to be human. You tell me what it's supposed to be if I'm supposed to live this human life. You show me the way. And one of the things that he's going to, that it says is it's, that he made the pioneer of our salvation perfect through what he suffered. Oh, man. So there's still suffering involved? Yeah. There's suffering involved. If we're going to make our way to rule with Jesus, then it is the path of suffering. It's the path that Jesus took. Jesus went to glory through the path of suffering. And that's not going to be any different for us. There's going to be times in which we are tempted to choose comfort instead of suffering. There's going to be times in which, you know, the Lord is leading us to share our faith in our workplace but we, we know we might face a few consequences for that. We might get shut out of some of the, the parties. We might not have the promotions that we might have in front of us. There are certain things that we may suffer along the way. That's part of it. The way to rule with Jesus is to share in his sufferings. To share in his sufferings. That's the path that he forged. And when we follow Jesus, and, and as he did that, then we're going to think, where, where were the times, Jesus, that you could have kind of went around the suffering, but you didn't? And you remember the time when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness by, the, by Satan? In Matthew chapter 4, he gave three temptations. And one of those temptations that Satan gave was what? You can have all these kingdoms. It can all be yours. You can rule, Jesus. You came here to rule. You came here to be exalted king over everything. Here's the deal. You don't have to go to the cross for that. You don't have to suffer for that. I'll give you the kingdoms right now. All you've got to do is worship me. All you've got to do is worship me. 
And what did Jesus say? He referred to the scriptures and he said, you shall only worship the Lord your God. Only. So that leads me to think, okay, Jesus, that's how you stayed on the trail towards glory. You endured the suffering. You avoided the temptation. And the temptation was to worship something else. So when I'm going through the temptation and I'm, I think I should share my faith with my coworker, but ah, there's maybe some risk there. I might lose something there. That's when I need to ask myself, what else am I tempted to worship if I don't? Am I tempted to worship my job security? Am I tempted to worship the approval of people around me? What else am I tempted to worship? And how can I follow Jesus? I can follow Jesus when I hear him say, Yep, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Ah, and so now I follow the pioneer of my salvation. I say, okay, I'm going down that path, Jesus. I saw how you did it. You did it, and you ended up in glory. I'm going to do it, and I'm going to trust that you will bring me to glory as well. See? So can we do that? Can we reorient ourselves around Jesus to the point that we can say, Jesus, I'm going to follow you even if it requires suffering? See? Do you want to know Jesus in 2024? That might be the thing you need to ask yourself. Am I willing to reorient myself in such a way that I'm willing to suffer, but I know that if I follow Jesus through the suffering, I'll end up in glory with him, right? So that's, that's pioneer. That's pioneer. The second role is as our brother. We know Jesus as our pioneer, but we also know Jesus as our brother. I love this picture. We see in verse 11, both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. There's this picture of family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. He's our great big brother. He's a great big brother. I'm a big brother. I wasn't a great big brother. I, I, there were moments in which I could have been a better brother to my sister, but I didn't want to be. I just wanted to kind of do my thing, and she could do her thing. And there were times in which she was um, being bullied, and I didn't do anything about it. And I think about that. I wasn't a great big brother. Jesus is a great big brother. And, and the way that he is a brother to us is, it says in verse 11, he's the one who makes us holy. He's the older brother that we can follow as an example. He's the older brother who's showing us, oh, that's what it means to be human. That's what a fully alive human being looks like. I can follow that. And I can be led by Jesus into knowing what that looks like. He's a great older brother. When we were in, in Kansas, we, were, we went to an ice skating rink. And um, the girls were ice skating on this rink. And a bunch of people there, a lot of first-timers were there. But I was tracking with this father who was teaching his son how to ice skate. And the son, he was, you know, shaky legs and, you know, wobbling on the ice like this. And, and the father was just so patient, just seeing every little movement and being there to pick him up or being there to kind of guide him. You'd hold him by the hands and he would, he would skate backwards so that the son could skate forward and he'd just follow his pace just ever so slow. He, they probably went around that rink 30 to 40 times. And the father is just like this, going at his pace. Every now and then, the son would be a little tired and, and want a break, so he'd lean up against the, the rail there, and then the father would just take off. He would just go off, and he would skate like, like he was this master skater. And he'd go off, and then he'd come back around to the son, and then the son would be ready, and then he'd slow himself down again and back up like this again. And I just love this picture of of how this father was willing, even though he knew how to skate like better than anybody there, he was willing to slow himself down to go at the pace of where this little boy was. 
And that's how Jesus is with us. Jesus is the master skater. He's the master human. He lived this perfect life, fully consecrated to the Father, fully loving God with all of his heart, fully loving his neighbor, following the Father's will, and yet he's willing to slow down with us while we're struggling to trust in God, while we struggle in our prayer life, while we struggle to love our neighbor, while we struggle to get over our own fears and truly live in his peace. There's Jesus slowing himself way, way down right to where we are, and he's willing to skate with us at our pace. What a great big brother. What a great big brother, so patient, so kind. Now, how do we orient ourselves to a brother like this? Well, first of all, will I allow myself to be called his little brother or his little sister? Will I allow myself to be part of the family? I don't know, you you know, when you think about family, you were maybe at a family table over Christmas and you saw you know, everyone around the table, and everyone was enjoying Christmas together. Maybe that was your picture. And then, you know, if there's any, any family table, there's always that kooky uncle or that kooky aunt or, you know, some dysfunctional kind of thing going on in a family. And you go, yeah, when I think about family, I'm not sure I'm all that positive about family, you know, because family could be messy. I want you to put that aside. I want you to think of what the perfect family would be like. Hmm. If on Christmas Day you walked by God's house in your neighborhood, and you just walked by and you just listened and you saw and you looked and you saw all the lights were on inside, what would you hear? Laughter, people getting along. You'd see people arriving at the door and the door would open and someone would welcome that person with a great big hug, and, and they would be in that family, and you could hear, you know, music is playing, people are singing. Just, to, just think of that. That's the family that Jesus is inviting you into. When you place your trust in Jesus, you not only just have this relationship with Jesus, but you have this relationship in a family the family of God in which all of us are loved and all of us start living and acting like our Father. That's what it means to be in the family of Jesus. So he's our older brother. He's our older brother. And what does it say? Jesus, at the end of verse 11, really important, really important. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. You know, when Jesus sees us and we're like that little boy just trying to learn how to skate, Jesus doesn't look down on us. He's not ashamed of us because we don't know how to love God with all our hearts yet. He's not. He's not ashamed at all. There's no shame. There's no condemnation in Christ Jesus for those who believe in him. So to reorient myself around Jesus as my older brother, will I let him remove the shame of failure? When I don't have it all together, when I am still trying to figure stuff out, will I not let myself be subjected to shame? The shame that I can put on myself or the shame that others can put on me. Can I hear Jesus say to me, I am not ashamed of you. You're my brother. You're my sister. We're family. There's no shame. There's no condemnation. If you mess up, you don't have to feel shame about failure. That's the kind of brother that we have in Jesus. Can you orient yourself around a brother who says, You can fail, and it's okay. You can mess up, and I don't condemn you. You can be weak. You can be broken. You can be at your worst, and I love you. Can you you handle that? Can you live with a brother like that? Can you live with a Jesus like that? Because that's 
what's going to happen. The more you get to know Jesus as your elder brother, the more you're going to realize he's not ashamed to call me brother. He's not ashamed to call me sister. Because we're in this family together. It's a beautiful family. No shame. So will you let Jesus' tender, brotherly connection with you dispel the shame? Maybe it's a shame that doesn't come from today's failure. Maybe there's shame you're living with from the past. Things that you've regretted, things you've done before, that you're still carrying the weight of that shame with you. And Jesus is saying, why? Why? I died for that. I died. I carried that upon myself. What? There's no shame here. There's none. It's just love. Just love. So this is what Jesus is inviting us into. The more that we get to relate to him as our pioneer and as our brother, we're starting to understand what it means then to rule to rule. Because if I follow him through suffering, and then if I follow him as my older brother who's teaching me how to be holy, now I'm going to start to gain this capacity to rule. To rule. Meaning, what does it mean to rule? Here's just an example of that. Just in case you're thinking, rule? I don't, I don't, what is this? I mean, it's, we're going to be on thrones and all? What, what does it mean to rule? What it means to rule is simply whatever domain God has given to you. Domain can be the people around you, your family, your coworkers, whatever domain, the neighborhood, what Ruth is talking about with her neighbors, that's her domain that God has assigned to her. Every one of us has a domain. And we are to rule in a way that brings and ushers the kingdom, ushers the peace of God, the shalom of God, so that that domain can know harmony and know peace the way that God designed. So when you're trying to figure out relationships and there's, there's friction going on and there's conflict and you're in a, you're in a relationship and, and you really love this person, but you know it's just toxic. And there's, there's a time and a place for you to just say, I'm putting up a boundary. I'm going to end this thing. I can't be around this person. That's hard to do. It takes some courage to do that. But that is, if Jesus is leading you to do that, then you follow Jesus and say, I'm going to end this. i got to put a wall up in this relationship. It's not good. It's not good. That is how you rule. You rule when you say, in my domain, I'm going to want to create good, healthy relationships with certain people. I just can't do it, so I'm going to put up a wall. Or it might be that you've got conflict in a relationship, and there's some really hard stuff, but Jesus is saying, I want you to work towards peace and reconciliation with this person and Jesus is saying this to you and then he's saying if you do this you will learn how to rule in your relationships so he gives us wisdom in how we handle conflict how we deal in relationships around us that's how we rule that's ruling that's just one example of ruling Right? So this is what it means when we can follow Jesus and we can just say, Jesus, what do you have to say about this relationship? Or what do you have to say about how I'm handling my money over here? Whatever it is, when we follow Jesus and we say, Jesus, you take the lead on this and you show me how to do this as my older brother, now we're starting to understand what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to rule with him. There's three more roles that we're going to look at next time. But I think we've got enough to go on as we're looking at this next year. Can we follow Jesus as our pioneer? And even if it means suffering with him. And can we trust Jesus to be our older brother who will teach us how to be holy and how to be human and will not condemn us when we mess up? Can we go into this year saying, Jesus, this is what I want to know you like this. Will you make that res resolution in your heart? Will you just say, Jesus, yeah, that's what I want. I want to know you. Let's pray.
Lord, we thank you that as we follow you, Jesus, and we get to know you, Jesus, that you will help us get to know ourselves and know our destiny and know that we were meant to rule with you. So, Lord Jesus, we thank you. We hear your promise. We hear your invitation. It is so alluring, Lord, because it restores us to the place that you intended for us. So, Lord, help us to see you, Jesus. Help us to see you and help us to hear you and follow you as our pioneer and as our brother. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.